Okay, let's start our English class. And I'd like to introduce Gans. He is a representative of uh, IREB, the Certific Certification Center. And uh, he will tell you about what is its requirements in engineering and why it is important and uh, why it is important to get a certificate because it's an international requirements engineering. And uh, I'd like to mention that after his speech, Gans will give you a gift uh, for the person who will ask the most interesting question. Okay. Thank you very much, Anna. Oh, this is loud. Okay, um, welcome. I'm uh, very honored to be in your uh, middle. And I'm uh, also very pleasantly surprised to see so many of you taking interest in uh, requirements engineering. And I hope that in the next uh, half hour, uh, I will give you a small introduction into requirements engineering, which is, of course, a big uh, professional field that can't be treated in half an hour anyway. But uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Hans van Loenhout. I come from the Netherlands. I'm there a teacher and consultant in software testing and requirements engineering. I've been in IT for already 35 years, and I started as a COBOL programmer a long time ago. And for the last five years, I took interest in, is in uh, requirements engineering. And now, uh, now I'm a member of the International Requirements Engineering Board, and in, on this behalf, I will give you this presentation. Let's see what uh, I can tell you. I will tell you uh, something about requirements engineering itself. What is it? And I will tell you about certification. What, why is it important to have a certificate in requirements engineering? I will tell you something about the history and the work of the IRI, uh, uh, International Requirements Engineering Board. And at the end, I will tell you something about recent developments in requirements engineering, which we summarize under the umbrella as uh, requirements engineering anywhere. But first, what is requirements engineering? And to know that, we've, we have to take a look at requirements itself. What are requirements? There's a nice IEEE standard definition for it. It's something about a user needing something. A user has certain needs because he wants to do something. He wants to solve a problem. He wants to reach a goal. And this goal doesn't uh, arise from itself. There are certain needs that must be fulfilled before this goal can be reached. That's the first part of requirements engineering. The second part is engineering. What is engineering? Engineering is something about development making something, creating something, designing something. And engineering is always about designing something for an intended function, something a user once again needs, something a user wants to do with a system or something. And then we come to the scope of requirements engineering. It's all about systems doing something, systems providing a function, and the function will be provided to the environment to the context of this system. That's an important notice from requirements engineering. Everything uh, that, that is starts for requirements engineering starts not in the system itself. It starts in the environment, in the context, in the people, in the stakeholders that are in that um, environment. And this system, to provide this function, has certain needs. And requirements engineering and we don't look at the system itself, but we look at the environment, the relevant environment for the future system. For the, uh, we look at the intended function of this system, and we look at the needs that are necessary to, f to provide this function. And then requirements engineering is next, the designing of a solution that will enable developers to develop a system providing that, uh, that uh, function. So you could do this haphazard, but requirements engineering for the last, I think, 
10, 15 years has become a professional discipline. As we call it, a systematic, disciplined approach on the specification and on the management of requirements. That is how we define requirements engineering. And why would we do this? Well, it has these objectives. First of all, we want to create systems that provide value, that provide solutions to customers who ask for a solution. And by doing this in a disciplined approach, you will minimize the risk that you will deliver a system that doesn't fulfill these needs. And of course, we all know that in the past we have developed systems that fail to exactly fulfill the uh, needs of the customer. And requirements engineering helps to improve that. We do that by investigating the whole landscape of problems and goals of the stakeholders. Often a stakeholder comes to you and he says, I, I have, have this certain goal for this system. But when you start investigating it, 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 it rolls out to be a complete landscape of problems and goals and they all are interconnected. And as a requirements engineer, you must uh, map this, this landscape and after that only you can provide the solution. And often, more than one solution will be able to solve the problems uh, of the stakeholders and, and uh, reach the goals of the stakeholders. So you must um, achieve consensus between different stakeholders who might have different goals. And at the end, you will have to help the stakeholders to select and choose from possible solutions, the right solution that gives the most value to them. And after that, you as a requirements engineering will be uh, participate in projects to implement this solution. Why would we do this? Because facts and figures from investigations on software projects um, show that projects often fail in a certain way. And we found out that 60% of the errors found during software development originate from the requirements engineering phase. Because if you have done this not in a professional way, and you start a project with unclear requirements, with vague requirements, with missing requirements, then it's almost impossible to deliver a system that fulfills the needs of the customer. And the worst part of it is that defect, defects originating from the uh, requirements phase of a project are often discovered very late in the project, in the acceptance test phase, uh, phase, or even worse, in the operational phase. And as we all know, these kind of errors are very uh, uh, expensive to fix. We call this fault multiplication. Faults that you leave in, uh, in a system during development tend to create more errors. Um, yes. It's already known um, from the uh, early um, 1980 uh, years in the book uh, Sof uh, Software Engineering e Economics from Barry Beam. He already found out that a, f a defect that you leave in a system during development will tend to um, en en uh, enlarge costs five to ten times for every state. So if you have a defect that originates from the requirements engineering phase and you don't solve it there and you find it during programming, it will cost you 20 times more than if you found it or if you um, didn't make it in the requirements phase. And if you find it during acceptance testing, it will cost you 100 times more. So requirements engineering is uh, based on um, providing better requirements at the start of a project that will result in a higher quality system at lower costs at the end. That is the rationale for which we do requirements engineering as a professional uh, discipline. I won't tell you much about this, um, this slide because this is the content of a three days course and uh, we can't treat this in uh, 30 minutes. But these are the main activities that IREP discerns as parts of requirements engineering. The first one is the elicitation phase. 
elicitation is about uh, trying to get the requirements out of the stakeholders by interviews, by reading books, by observing their behavior and their processes, etc. The first step is elicitation of the requirements. After that, you have to document them, you have to model them, you have to structure them. That's the next step in requirements engineering. And after you've done that, you have to validate them. And often you find out that there are conflicts between requirements engineer uh, between stakeholders who have different opinions about a certain requirement. So negotiation is also part of it, and it's all embedded in a part that we call requirements management. It's about prioritizing, about keeping changes in track, about um, the traceability between requirements. So this is what well in a basic course of requirements engineering will be taught. Who are the clients of the requirements engineer? In, in principle, we have three clients. First of all, it's the customer. The customer, the group of stakeholders has certain needs, but often the stakeholders are not capable of exactly defining what they need. So the requirements engineer is the one who explains to the customer what is the complete picture of what he needs. After that, this picture is handed over to the developers and they use it as a blueprint for the system that they are going to develop for the customer. The system that will fulfill the needs of the customer. And at the end, the same blueprint is handed over to the testers and the testers will check whether the developers have built the system that the client asked, that the customer asked. I um, told uh, you that requirements engineering nowadays is a professional discipline, a systematic disciplined approach to this field. And to have this in the market as a re recognizable profession, you need more than just ideas on requirements engineering. You need a established body of knowledge that is recognized in the market. It is composed of a common terminology, an agreed methodology, uh, a shared set of standards and techniques. And if you have that, that's not enough even. You have to have an authority to take responsibil uh, responsibility to maintain this set, this body of knowledge. And you have to educate your professionals to do their profession according this, to this body of knowledge. And uh, to prove that this all works, we have certification. Certification is about setting a baseline for the body of knowledge of a certain field uh, that will be used for education of the professionals and for examination then to be able to show that they um, they have the knowledge that they are supposed to have. So um, a syllabus for a certification scheme sets this baseline and provides a fundament for the training. It improves communication between the trainers between for the training. And it motivates professionals to do something on education because with a certificate you can prove that you have reached a certain level. It motivates organizations to invest in training and um, it offers a, pro a possibility to show to the outside world that you as an uh, individual or as an organization have, a cert have reached a certain uh, level of knowledge in this field. This is the way certification works. It's, it all works according to an ISO standard, the ISO 17024, and it says there are four parties involved in certification. First of all, there's a, an authority that owns the certification scheme, that is the owner or the maintainer of the body of knowledge. Then you have training providers who translate this uh, body of knowledge into practical courses that can be taught to trainees. You have the trainees that interact with the training providers 
to uh, acquire this body of knowledge, and you have certification bodies who independently check whether or not the trainees have obtained, have achieved the level of knowledge. And in this case, we talk of IREP, the International Requirements Engineering Board, as the holder of the certification scheme, the content of the body of knowledge. The International Requirements Engineering Board, which we briefly call IREP, is a, the think tank for this field. It is composed of uh, 16 full members, which are world experts on this field from universities all over the world, from uh, big industries, from uh, training uh, instances, etc. And uh, they are um, surrounded by, at the moment, 66 associate members who come from all over the world and are practical requirements engineers that are um, outstanding in the field. And the number of associate members is, uh, the last years, is quite rapidly growing. And the activities for the uh, uh, IREP are the elaboration of the curriculum and the syllabus, uh, maintaining the glossary, preparing exam questions, all uh, related to the syllabus of requirements engineering. And we publish articles, we have uh, written textbooks, we provide references on the field. Let me show you a short history on uh, IREP. It started in uh, 2006, so more than 10 years ago, when a group of um, international experts in the field gathered at a conference in Nuremberg and decided they, that they, had, they wanted to do something to establish it, requirements engineering as a, dis a separate discipline. The first year was uh, spent on, oh no, at the end of 2006, they uh, founded an association, a non-profit organization, to make this work. And the first year was spent on the certification scheme, the syllabus, the glossary, that kind of things. And at the end of uh, 2007, we launched our first uh, um, level, the foundation level, uh, to the market. And the first candidates got their certificate. The next few years were spent on developing some uh, advanced level uh, courses. We have now uh, the requirements elicitation and consolidation uh, course, which, by the way, is now being upgraded to a 2.0 uh, level. We have requirements modeling, and in 2015, we added required management as an advanced course. And 2014 was also an important landmark for the IREP. We started publishing the uh, RE magazine, which is a free uh, online uh, magazine that uh, publishes uh, every uh, th three times a year some articles on uh, requirements engineering. Um, this year is also a very important year for um, IREP. We released two models on agility in requirements engineering. Uh, in the beginning of this year, we released an Agile Primer, which is intended for uh, team members from Agile teams uh, to introduce the subject of requirements engineering and how to apply this in Agile environments. And um, in autumn, we will launch the advanced level course on requirements engineering. Also, in this year, we will launch uh, the expert level, which is now in a pilot phase. And a other very important uh, of, uh, event in 2017 was that we merged with Rugby. Rugby was a similar organization, also committed to professional requirements engineering. And we discovered together that we did almost the same and we decided to join forces and we now continue under the name uh, IREP all over the world. This is our certification scheme. We have a foundation level that has no prerequisites 
and recently we added this Agile primer to it. From this foundation level, you can go, if you want, to advanced level, in which we have three models, elicitation, consolidation, modeling, and management. And soon we will have RE at Agile, an advanced level on agility. And if you still want to go further in requirements engineering, you can become an expert, and you can become an expert after you have reached three advanced levels, but uh, they may be substituted by other outstanding activities in requirements engineering. The foundation level is targeted at almost everybody working in IT projects. And the Agile Primer is especially interested for, interesting for the Agile team members, while product owners also could do something with the foundation level. The advanced levels are more for the senior business analysts and uh, requirements engineering uh, persons, and process managers would also be interested in the management uh, module, and product owners would be interested in the RE at Agile uh, advanced level, while the expert level is specially intended for business analysts and uh, requirements engineering who have reached a certain seniority in the field. I think we are uh, quite a success uh, in the market. Uh, in the 10 years that we exist, we uh, have uh, more than 40,000 uh, candidates who, commu uh, who, pa uh, who um, took the exam and almost of approximately the 80% of them uh, passed the exam successfully. And um, just yesterday I heard that uh, in the first quarter of 2070 we once again had a growth of 20%, so the growth is still going on. Excellent. We are present in uh, almost uh, 70 countries all over the world. It's a little bit exaggerated because, for instance, in New Zealand, we only have two candidates, so, but we count it as a separate country. And this is important for you, you if you are interested in requirements engineering. We have this uh, um, online magazine, remagazine.irab.org. It's free for everyone, and it publishes uh, three times a year some interesting uh, articles on the field of requirements engineering. I can advise you, go there and look for yourself. Now, um, to finish my talk, I like to tell you something about recent um, developments in, in the field of requirements engineering. In the past, uh, we concentrated on elicitation. At the start of a project, finding out what are the needs of the customers. And then we handed over it to a development project and we said, good luck with it, and uh, well, we disappeared. Now, we found out there's a, whoops, let's go fast, faster than I wanted. There's a better way. And we discovered it by participating in Agile projects. And nowadays we believe it's not the start only, but you must be in the field, uh, in, the, in the project itself, because requirements develop during system development. And you must be there to assist the developers to explain what the customer really wants. And there are changes and there are uh, better elaborations. And, well, requirements engineering spreads out its wings to development especially in, require, in uh, agile uh, projects in which you, we have uh, a cycle of um, design, build, test, design, build, test until we deploy. And well, uh, requirements engineering can be very useful as a team member in an agile team. By the way, uh, such team members are often called business analysts and not requirements engineering, but that's just the wording. Um, Similar to uh, the Agile world, we therefore um, uh, developed an Agile of uh, an uh, RE manifesto, in which we said 
Techniques, modelings, models and templates are important for our work. It's the basis. But genuine ent empathy, understanding what the client really needs, is more important. Comprehensive elicitation, detailing all requirements, structuring them is important. But creating solutions that deliver value to the customer, that's the key point. Upfront specification is important. Of course, when you start a project, you must know in which direction you go. But we found out that you don't need to elaborate everything at the start. In time el elaboration, elaborate requirements when they're needed. is much more important than do everything up front. And documentation is important, but as we all know, in Agile, documentation is less important. Creating shared understanding, that's more important. Shared understanding between the customer, the developer, the tester, the end user, and as a requirements engineer, you're in the middle and you explain to each other what they really need and they really want. So I want to end with this um, Agile, uh, RE manifesto, and I think if you um, absorb them, you have the core values of requirements engineering, and I hope with my short talk that I can convince you that it's an important success factor for projects that really deliver value to your customers. Thank you. That was exactly half an hour. Thank you, Gans. And uh, any questions? Yes, slide for questions. Anybody? Oh. Just a moment. Hello. So many questions. <laughs> Hello. All right. Here. I have two questions okay. for you. The first one is short one about uh, the d difference, the exact difference between the business analytics and requirement engineers. You mentioned it, but uh, I couldn't understand uh, the main difference in these terms between these terms. Well, that's, that's a very good question, of course. Um, and there's much, um, well, confusion about these terms. Um, I think in, in, in many organizations these terms overlap and there is not much difference. But if you look into to, to the definitions of it, then the, the business analyst analysis is more about um, the processes which are uh, present in a certain organization, the, the looking to them, uh, designing them, structuring them, and requirements engineering is a next step, translating the needs of the processes into the blueprint for the system development. So they, they work close together, but I think uh, business anal analysis, in my view, is on a higher extraction level. Thank you. And the second question is about uh, the most important secondary skills for uh, the person who is a professional in uh, requirement uh, engineering. Maybe it's some technical skills or communication skills. What do you think about it? I think, and I'm personally very convinced about that, that communication skills are the most important thing. Empathy, understanding what your customers really need, be able to explain it to developers and testers, that's the core business of a requirements engineer. It's all about communication. Communication is about concepts that are in the head of your clients, your shareholders. You must be able to take them out, put them in your own head, and then give them uh, to other people who uh, will do some work with it. So communication is, for me, it's the, all, the, the far most important factor. So uh, such professionals should be like a bridge between the customers, the developers, and maybe some exactly. other uh, sides. Oh, thank you. Exactly. Thank you for your talk. Uh, my question is, what is the, the 
intended scope of uh, application of this required engineering body of knowledge? Like what are the projects uh, that are, can benefit in terms of size, maybe people involved, or uh, on, on the other hand, on the other hand, maybe uh, does this uh, process, uh, is, mm, is it elastic enough uh, to accommodate maybe some smaller project? Uh, maybe you can use some subset of these things. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, there's no restriction on size or uh, scope of uh, requirements engineering. You see it applied in, in uh, well, it started in large industries. It started in automotive industries and that, that sort of things, in which requirements are should be very specific because otherwise at the end you have a car with three wheels or something. But it extended to bank uh, applications, to insurance applications, to well, also very small uh, agile projects. You, you can apply it everywhere because it's about this communication, about understanding what your client wants. And that's difficult because your client cannot exactly specify what he wants. And by ap applying requirements engineering, you, you make clear what are the problems and the goals of all um, connected stakeholders. And from that, you help them to find a solution. And that's your input for your development project. And it can be in all sizes. I'm, this is my convention. Maybe some other people will think differently. But for me, this. It's, it's, it's not the, the, the techniques and so on. The, the, they are important, but the, the understanding is more important. And understanding is uh, always important for a small project just as a, for a big. Of course, the risks in a big project are higher. You can lose more money if you screw it. But it's, uh, the importance is, is the same. Uh, I want to take uh, Arab certificate. Uh, what should I, shall I do that for this? <laughs> well, you could come to the Netherlands and I could give you a training, of course, but really? I th don't think that's very practical. Well, um, there's the syllabus. It's free, downloadable on the, on the internet, on, on our uh, website. There's a book uh, on requirements engineering from uh, Professor Paul uh, that was... Uh, the start of uh, this this uh, syllabus, so you could uh, read the book. And uh, well, I'm not sure uh, if it's possible here in uh, Russia at the moment to have a course, but uh, a course is always the best uh, way to uh, acquire knowledge, I think. But I'm prejudiced because I'm a trainer. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, why did you choose this profession and what were the main reasons for you to do this? Oh, that's an interesting question. Because uh, I wasn't a requirements engineer, I was a software tester. I've been software tester for, for 20 years or so. But as a software tester, I found out that the, the, the most important problems that I discovered in acceptance testing were defects that originated from the requirements engineering phase. And then I thought, I should learn more about requirements engineering. So if I can prevent the defects there, then I don't have to uh, get them out at the end. And that's much more, uh, that's much more uh, cost effective. So from that interest, I shifted my focus to requirements engineering. Hi. Oh. <laughs> um, we all know that uh, education in uh, universities nowadays uh, is outdated in IT te uh, specifications. Oh, in Russia too. Oh, okay. I'm Looks from, like Holland. <laughs> well, I'm from Kyrgyzstan, <laughs> and the situation there is even worse. But uh, what I want to ask is how flexible you are to ensure that the certificates you give to your uh, trainees are not outdated and uh, are really needed in accordance with the uh, changing requirements and changing 
Yeah, I, I understand your question. Yeah, okay. Well, um, well, it's it's for me it's rather simple. We have we have a policy that we renew our syllabus every five years or so. And what I, I told you here on the slides, our associate members are people who are working in the field from day to day. They know what problems there are, and they come with to us with suggestions to to enhance our slides, uh, our syllabus, and to to um, well make it fit to the the market needs. Yeah, well, I, I agree. I, I fully agree. We, we were late in Agile, and it, it was, I may admit it, it was a little bit caused by some professors in our board who are, well, they are giving these courses on the universities, and they are a little bit conservative. But nowadays we have a new uh, chairman, and he's very progressive and has a good vision on where to go in the, in the next few years. And now we accelerated uh, our uh, renewal of our syllabi, and we uh, in, uh, installed several working groups to improve uh, and to make sure it fits. I, 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 last, last year in, in our member board, I said, we don't want to be the Nokia of uh, IT. Because, well, they were world leader, and they didn't change, they didn't innovate, and now it's all uh, Samsung and iPhone. And we, d we, we f face the same problem if we don't innovate all over the time. So we were committed to that, yes. Unfortunately, we have uh, six minutes, so two or three questions. Gentlemen okay. here. Uh, no, no. Good afternoon, Hans. Uh, maybe. Uh, thank you. Hello. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I want to ask a question about uh, what is the, for the men in the professional uh, requirements in engineering, what is a good balance in the, uh, working with the client and the elicitation of the requirements and working with the development team and with the architect and the design team to making the blueprints for the, uh, what is the good balance for this? How do you mean in, in, in the amounts of people working on no, it? No, I mean in the amounts of efforts uh, put in the separate uh, Ooh, working. Wow, I think that's a real tough question to answer. But I think, I, well, from my personal experience, I can say, uh, from agile teams, I could say uh, you, you would need um, one business analyst requirements engineer for a team of eight people or something. That, that would be a good... Um, good uh, balance, but uh, well, he uh, in an agile team, the, these these roles are not strictly separated. So, a uh, requirements engineer could also do some acceptance testing at the end, for instance. Mm -hmm. So, 10% of your effort or something that would be a good idea. Okay. Huh? Uh, uh, good afternoon, thank you for your presentations. And You're my welcome. question is, uh, what is, uh, in your opinion, an ideal requirement? How do you mean ideal requirement? So maybe, um, so an, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean that uh, an ideal requirement is that uh, something that can cover a lot of some sub requirements or something else. Well, the, uh, the ideal requirements specification is, is, is a complete set. It contains functional requirements, mm -hmm. it contains quality requirements, it contains constraints, and it's all interrelated. It's structured. You, know for, you must know, for instance, if you have a quality requirement on performance, what functional requirement is asking for this performance? And, and you need traceability. So. Um, the ideal requirement set is a whole set that completes the picture, that, that captures the essence of a system. Okay. And the second question, uh, in your opinion also, is it possible to um, uh, fulfill two controversial uh, requirements? That's, that's uh, really something that is tough for requirements engineering, yes. That's what we call the negotiation process. And, well, uh, often 
stakeholders have different opinions on a requirement, and you can't uh, put two different requirements, two, two different versions of, of a requirement in one system. So you have to talk until it's solved. That's the only thing that I could say. But it's a tough part of your work, yes. Can I ask one more question? Yes. Uh, okay, thanks for your presentation. It was great and awesome and really informative. But uh, the modern reality shows us that the time is precious while you are doing your project. And what is the best way to save your time and have fulfilled requirements? Well, the, the best way to, to proceed in requirements engineering, for my opinion, is to start with only high-level requirements that give you a direction for your, um, for your project. And uh, one, one, uh, main, uh, one key point is what I call in-time elaboration. Don't start too early with too detailed requirements because you'll waste them. Start with broad goals and at the point in time that you need more detail, add more detail. But don't try to put all detail in the beginning of your project because you'll waste much, much effort. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is uh, about uh, certification exam. Mm -hmm. Uh, you told that uh, advanced level exam uh, is consists of uh, several parts, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I want to ask: um, uh, <coughs> Are uh, these parts uh, uh, the separate uh, exams, or it's no. uh, parts of one exam? No, no, there are separate modules. In in each module, you can do an exam if you want. But uh, at the advanced level. It's not only an exam, it's also an uh, assignment. You have to do some homework, you have to uh, write an, uh, an, an article on a project that you're working on, and you have to show that what you learned in, in the exam, or mm -hmm. you, the knowledge that you, exam, uh, that you were examined in, that you applied it in a project. So it's oh. two parts. First you do the exam, and then you have one year to do your practical uh, application. Okay, thank you. <laughs> That's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I think we, uh, in this way, provide real advanced level requirements engineers to the market. Another question. Uh, uh, if I remember correctly, the PM body of knowledge, uh, it has some software supplement or something, and it does cover a bit the requirement engineering. Mm -hmm. I think it's called like specifications or something like that. How does uh, this standard maybe correlate in some ways with the project management body of knowledge? Thank you. I'm afraid I can't answer that question because I have no, not enough knowledge about uh, the project management specification part. But I, I'm convinced that it doesn't bite. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, you told about uh, uh, customer satisfying, um, and what is better to get uh, requirements from a uh, customer or user of a uh, development system, and how do you handle it? Well, that's also a very good question. I will be in doubt who to give the book then. <laughs> but, um, well, it's more than that. Uh, we, we talk about stakeholders and stakeholders can be the, 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 the customer, the one who pays for the project, but the end users are important. But if you develop a system for, for the internet or so, 
yeah, try to get a selection of future users uh, in the field and, and maybe some uh, legislation is important and you have to know about that and maybe uh, a finance department is interested. So the, 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 the range of stakeholders that you must uh, incorporate in your elicitation can be quite large and that's, that's the first step that you as a requirements engineer should do try to see who are your stakeholders and why uh, do you have to uh, get them in, into your uh, scope. That was the last one, uh, Anna. I'll help you a little bit. Please stand up who ask the question. All of you. Yes, please, please. and you will select. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, in requirements engineering, there is no best question. All questions are good because the, the, the questions are not important. It's the answers that come from your customers, from your stakeholders. So I refuse to give a book to the best question. I give it to the first question because you need, you need a certain courage to uh, ask the first question in such a big hole. So who was the one who, that gave the first question? I have a book for you. I can't read it because it's in Russian, but it, uh, I, I've been told that it's uh, about um, uh, use cases and user stories and making better use cases, uh, better user stories. And that's also a part of uh, requirements engineering, the modeling part. So thank you very much for your contribution and good luck with it.